everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Educational uh, Program. Today, I've invited uh, my friend, Dr. William Lester from the University of Florida, who is a frequent educational partner of mine. We do lots of stuff together. Um, we've been visiting in a gated community almost every week. Now I think we're back on an every other week schedule, um, the two of us. You know, and we, we do that too. We'll come out to your community and, you know, have in person classes. Um, but today we are having this Zoom class on taking the mystery out of landscape irrigation. For the next two weeks, um, we're going, to, I let Dr. Lester take the lead because we're talking about um, your irrigation system, basically. And and next week, we're going to talk about fertilization. So therefore, I asked him to join me because he does better at that than I do. <laughs> I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities for the Water Department. My program in which I teach water conservation is Florida Friendly Landscaping. There are two emails at which you could reach me. Um, if you would like a PDF copy of this program when we are finished, I'll be glad to send you one. Or any other questions that you have, Lily B, L I L L Y B, at hernandocounty.us. Or you can email me at hernandocountyffl at hernandocounty.us. I got my first email at that email just this week. <laughs> or you can send questions to Dr. Lester at W. Lester at ufl.edu. Yours flows a whole lot better, Bill. A lot shorter. Yes. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. All of these classes, we are going to be bringing you these nine principles in one form or another. And today it's pretty obvious which one we're going to be um, highlighting, and that is. Oh, let me try to get it here. That is number two, water efficiently. Dr. Lester is going to teach us how to water efficiently using an automatic irrigation system. So having said that, I will let Dr. Lester uh, take over for now and uh, teach us about irrigation, why we need it, if we need it, and all the ins and outs. So thank you, Bill. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, irrigation is very important in uh, the landscape here in Central Florida. And it's kind of strange because here in Florida, over the period of a year, we get quite a bit of rain. Um, technically, the average is about 52 inches of rainfall a year. And if you look at that, you think, oh, well, I get one inch of rain every week, about and that should be plenty for growing, you know, my lawn, my trees, my bushes, my flowers, whatever it is you have growing in your yard. The problem is, as we see, especially this time of year, we, it's kind of feast or famine. So either we get a lot of rain over a short period of time, or we can go sometimes a month or two with very little rain. So you're going to have to supplement that natural rainfall with um, irrigation water. Some plants really do need irrigation, things like turf grass, whether it's the St. Augustine lawn or Bahia. St. Augustine needs more irrigation than Bahia because Bahia is just naturally very drought tolerant. It can get very dry and not be watered for a long time and it will start to look tan and it doesn't look very good, but as soon as it does rain, it tends to green right back up and start growing again and look good. Annuals, so any kind of annual flowers or small flowering plants that you're growing are going to need regular irrigation. A vegetable garden, I have a vegetable garden in my backyard, and when I get done here today, I have to go outside and water it because those are small plants. They have a small root system, doesn't go very deep, so it's going to dry out pretty quickly when it doesn't rain, and it's going to need additional irrigation. Other plants in your landscape, once they become established, and that's the important part, established, they really don't need a whole lot of additional irrigation from you. They're going to get by just fine on natural rainfall. Things like established trees, 
established palms, hedge bushes, need very little extra irrigation water. Now, the exception to this is a newly planted tree or palm tree or hedge bush. After you plant it, you have to water it daily for a little bit, then every other day, then every three days. And once it gets established, and that's going to take different periods of time, all depending on the size of the plant um, and how large the root system is. But once it gets established, you really don't have to water it much after that. Next slide, please. So here in Central Florida, as a general rule, about 60% of the water that is sent out by your utility company, and here in Hernando County, that's Hernando County Utilities, 60% of the water they pump out of the ground, clean, purify, and send out in pipes is used in um, home landscape irrigation. And that is a huge percentage. So only 40% of the water they send out is used for drinking, cooking, bathing, washing your car, washing the dog, whatever it might be. So that's an awful large percent of our water is being used for outdoor irrigation. Here in Hernando County, 100% of our drinking water comes from the aquifer or underground water. So it's very important that we um, learn how to conserve that so that we don't run short or run out of water and we take steps to help keep that water clean because if we foul it, it's very, very expensive to clean it to get it back to the point where it's usable for drinking, drinking, cooking, things like that. The average Floridian uses about 150 gallons per day. And here in Hernando County, we do generally really well on that number. I know that uh, Hernando County residents technically are not water hogs. So they stay within the average number of gallons per person used per day. But when you look at 60% of it is going towards outdoor irrigation, that's not really sustainable in the long run. You have to um, take steps to be mindful of that, tighten up on it. If you have an irrigation system and it is being powered by well water, you don't really pay for that. Sure, you pay for the you have to have a working pump, pump breaks, you have to replace it. There are costs involved. But if you're in a situation where you're having to pay for the water that's going to irrigation, you can see a major increase in your water bill. And nobody wants a great big water bill. Next slide, please. So the mysterious part about your home irrigation system is this thing, the irrigation controller. And for most people who have in-ground irrigation, this is going to be somewhere in your garage, and it's on the wall, and it has buttons and knobs and dials. Newer ones are generally completely digital, so they have lots of buttons and lots of little flashing numbers. Absolutely no idea how to operate it. It can be very confusing. It's not necessarily intuitive when you first start off. So... You may have uh, just a few zones in your irrigation system. You could have six or nine zones. I know of people with large properties that have 14 zones. So that's a fairly large overall system. And this one little electronic box here controls the whole thing. You have valves that are involved in the system. This is like an electronic, think of going to the kitchen and turning on your kitchen sink faucet, turn the water on, turn it off. A valve does the same thing, but electronically. It sent a signal and it opens that one zone so water can go and your sprinklers start going. When it comes time to turn off, <clears throat> it gets another pulse and turns the valve off and the water stops. You have the actual sprinkler heads and there's uh, a lot of different types. You have the rain sensor, which we're gonna talk about. With these um, units, as a general rule, all of them, unless you have a very, very, very old one, is going to have a battery backup. And what this does is very important because if you have um, a power outage, which doesn't happen to us very often, but it does happen, or maybe the power flashes or something happens to kind of jolt the circuits, the battery keeps the unit on. If the battery is dead or there's no battery in it, somebody took the battery out and just didn't replace it, 
What happens is your power goes off for five minutes, power comes back on, this box just resets itself. And now your sprinklers are gonna go off, who knows when? They may be going off every day now. They may be going off in the middle of the day. They may be running three times a day. It can happen when the box resets itself to the automatic default. So very important that you change the battery in these units. I know they tell us that when we uh, go through a time change, you should start with changing all your clocks. You should also change the batteries in your uh, smoke alarms. That's very important. But also get in the habit of changing the batteries in your um, irrigation timer also. That way you know the battery's always working. Very important, you become familiar with this and familiar with your system know where your zones are. So you should know zone one is in the front yard, zone two is on the side, zone three is part of my backyard. You should know how many zones you have and what's going on. And if you've purchased a house and you have an irrigation system and a mysterious unit and you don't have directions for it, let's say you purchased the house and no directions came with this, very, very easy those directions. On the front is going to tell who the manufacturer is. So, for example, in this picture, this is a Hunter, a Hunter system, and it's a Pro C. So, if you go to the Hunter website, they're going to have directions for all their different units that they make, probably back quite a few years. So, if you go looking through the list, you look up the Pro C unit, you're going to be able to find the directions for your unit. And as a general rule, most of these manufacturers have PDFs of the directions. So it's very easy for you to go there, open up the PDF, go ahead and print it. And now you have directions to your, your unit. If you can't find your unit, if you contact the company, they're gonna have an email address or phone number. They're generally very helpful. They're gonna help you figure out what model you have and they're gonna help you get the directions to it so that you can go through a page by page and become a lot more familiar with it. Next slide, please. So an in-ground irrigation system has different types of heads. One type is the rotor or gear drive head. These are the very large ones, and sometimes they're sticking up out of the ground all the time. Like the one on the left here, at least half of it is above ground all the time. The one on the right, when your unit, when your system goes on, it pops up out of the ground and starts spraying water. When it goes off, it drops back down so that you can cut the grass over it without hitting the sprinkler head. Very important. You don't want to be taking out irrigation heads with your lawnmower. So these um, heads are designed to deliver a large amount of water over a very large area. So they may cover half of your front yard and they very slowly go back and forth and back and forth and over time deliver the amount of water you want over a very large area so when these heads run it's not unusual for them to be set to run for a long time maybe even as much as, as an hour depending on how many square feet you're trying to cover with each head because it takes time for it to go back and forth and deliver water to a very, very large area. Next slide, please. Now, the other type of head that you probably have in your system is a pop-up or spray head. So some of these, like the one on the left, when your um, system goes on, they pop up out of the ground and start spraying water. When that zone shuts off, they boom, go back down into their little resting spot, their little hole, and they shut off. Other times, like on the right-hand side here, they could be mounted on top of a PVC pipe. This is very common in like a flower bed or a garden area, and they always are standing up. But if it's in a garden bed, you're never going to be in there with your lawnmower, so that's not an issue. You have to be very careful when you're working in your garden bed. You don't want to bump into them or bang them really hard because PVC pipes will snap, especially over time. PVC gets old and brittle. If you bump into this really hard or step on it or kick it, it'll snap and now you're going to have to replace it. So spray heads cover a small fixed area and they don't put out a lot of water per minute, 
but because they don't move and they're staying in that one specific area, they can put down a lot of water in that area in a short period of time. Typically, they're going to be set to run for a much shorter period of time, so maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, to wet and cover the area that they're supposed to be covering. Next slide, please. So another type of head that you may see in your, um, generally in your garden beds is called a bubbler or a shrub bubbler. And landscapers put this in when they build the house and put the landscape material in to give extra water right to the base of a plant where they planted it. Because for that bush or palm tree or whatever it is to get established, it's gonna need extra water just temporarily until it gets established. So a lot of times you'll see shrub bubblers still in somebody's landscape and the house is 10 years old. And it's still, it, it doesn't spray water all over. If you look at the head, the water just kind of bubbles out of that head and it puts down a large amount of water in a very, very small area. So if this is right at the base of a bush, like it is in this picture here, you're putting out a lot of water right at the base of that bush. And that shrub, if it's a couple years old, it doesn't need to be watered ever at all. It's going to get by just fine off of natural rainfall, unless we're in the middle of a long-term drought, which doesn't happen very often. So if you live in an older house and you're getting familiar with your irrigation system and you see that you have shrub bubblers, you probably need to turn them off. But that's very easy. If you see on the very top of the head, there's a little screw, generally a Phillips screw. Get your Phillips screwdriver, go out there, look down, turn it clockwise to the right to tighten it and turn it gently all the way down. And that should shut that individual um, sprinkler head off. You really don't need that after um, initial establishment of your landscape material. This can put down up to 30 gallons per hour. So it's technically not micro irrigation. If you're thinking, I, I, I have micro irrigation. Of, this doesn't count as micro irrigation. And a lot of times we'll, we'll see this in older landscapes and it's just, it's a big water waster. So when it comes to an in-ground irrigation system, inspect your system frequently, very important. If you have a service that cuts your lawn, you need to check it very frequently, as often as like once a month. Because if you think about this, you have uh, a gentleman out there on top of a couple hundred pound great big lawnmower, and he's zipping through your yard doing about 30 miles an hour and taking sharp turns and bouncing around. They put a serious beating on sprinkler heads and pipes. And they frequently either break or bump sprinkler heads. We're gonna see examples of both. And you need to be aware of this as soon as you can to go out there and fix it, otherwise, you're wasting water and your system's not putting water where it's supposed to be to wet the plants that you're trying to wet. Next slide. So uh, we, we're going to go through a bunch of pictures here and show you rights and wrongs. So this is wrong. You want to avoid irrigating in the middle of the day. Just waste a lot of water. You can see this. Um, these are just pop-up spray heads. And a lot of that water is going to evaporate and be wasted before it even makes it into the ground, which is where you want that water to go to water your lawn. So no watering in the middle of the day, especially on a very hot, sunny day. Next slide. In this picture, you see uh, this sprinkler head. This is one of the rotor heads that's covering a big area. It's out of adjustment because it's doing a wonderful job at watering that sidewalk. No matter how much you water a sidewalk, it's not going to grow. So this head is just out of adjustment. Many times, either the big rotor heads or the small spray heads are pretty easy to, to tweak just a little bit to get them to spray where you want them to spray. So if you walk around behind the sprinkler head and crouch down and grab it kind of firmly but gently, give it a little bit of a twist to the left, and then wait and let it go back and forth and see if it's going where you want it now, that should fix it. If it doesn't twist, you don't want to force it because now you're going to break a sprinkler head. You don't want that. You're going to have to replace it. Um, but just to, to turn them just a little bit, 
to fine tune it, generally very easy to do very quickly, physically right behind that sprinkler head. This is one of those things that happens very often from lawnmowers, people walking through your yard, people driving on your grass, these things get bumped and just get out of adjustment. Next picture. You have to check frequently for broken or damaged heads because what they do is they create little volcanoes of water like in this picture here. This is, it may have been a pop-up head that popped up and then didn't come all the way back down when it got shut off. It was still part way up. Somebody hit it with a lawnmower and boom, broken head, open pipe. So when your sprinklers go on, you're blowing water all over that flower bed, which can dig out the soil and the mulch and damage your plants. And if you think about it, the area that that head is designed to cover and water is not getting watered now. We're going to see more picture examples of that, of broken and damaged equipment and heads cause the problem of where you want it to be watered, it's not getting watered. And now your grass is going to dry out, might die, your plants might dry out and die. So this is something that you really need to be looking for and get fixed as quickly as you can. Next picture. Sometimes you may get leaks underground. So this is a picture here of a sprinkler head. It's a pop-up and it's down and everything looks okay with the head. I mean, it's there, it's not broken, it's not missing. But if you look at the sand around it, it almost looks like a little natural spring has been coming up. A lot of times if that head gets run over by a couple hundred pound lawnmower, it may get twisted and bent where the PVC pipe underground snaps and breaks. Now, when you sprinklers run in the middle of the night and you're tucked into bed asleep, instead of the head popping up and spraying like it should, water is pouring out of the pipe underground and creating a little um, sinkhole or void underground, wasting huge amounts of water. And that head, I guarantee you, is not sprinkling and watering where you wanted to and needed to. So look for sand, wet spots, puddles, things like that. That's something else that you need to look for when you're inspecting your system. Next picture. You need to avoid blocking irrigation heads because after you purchase, after they build a house or you purchase a house or you change out your landscape material out front, over time, it's gonna grow. It's gonna get bigger. Shrubs get bigger, bushes get taller. And now the sprinkler heads where they were positioned are being blocked by more mature plants. And they're not throwing water where they're supposed to be. Here you see a picture, and this is really common, uh, landscape material grows bigger, and now it blocks heads. You can't really see in this picture, but a lot of times heads in a flower bed are positioned to water the flower bed and water an area of turf grass beyond it. So if bushes grow up, it's going to block the water from maybe getting to the turf grass that's supposed to be getting to, and that's a problem. You're going to have to um, trim your bushes, adjust your system. If you have a fixed sprinkler head, like I showed one of the spray heads mounted on a PVC pipe, you can go in, cut that PVC pipe, attach uh, uh, another piece of PVC, make it taller. So you can go back and retrofit and uh, make adjustments to your system, but you're going to have to check for this and maybe do that as time goes on and things grow and your uh, lawn and landscape changes. Next slide. Sprinkler heads, almost all of them, if you take them apart and unscrew the little thing on the top, inside have a little uh, filter basket. And you can see here's a filter basket and it's full of black algae, you can get dirt in there, uh, little pieces of grass, weeds. If you're on a well, this can be a problem. If any of you either here today or watching this later are get um, reclaimed water, depending on how your entire system in your neighborhood is all laid out, you may get a certain amount of algae and other contaminants in it that are going to plug up these little filters. If that filter gets plugged up, your um, 
sprinkler head is not going to pop up correctly, not going to spray water out correctly. You're looking at it, it's like there's something wrong. It's it's hardly spraying at all. What could be wrong? It might be the uh, little uh, catch basket inside, something that a lot of people don't know of or don't think about. Next slide. So the little concrete donuts that you may have in your yard, the idea behind them is this little round piece of concrete that you put around a pop-up sprinkler head to block the grass from growing over the sprinkler head because if you have St. Augustine grass and runners grow over a sprinkler head, it can't pop up now. And it has to pop up to work correctly and cover the area it's supposed to. So keep those little donuts clean. The picture on the right-hand side here, that is absolutely perfect. That head, when, when that zone goes on, it's gonna pop up, spray and work just fine. The one on the left needs to be cleaned out. So this is just kind of another maintenance thing you need to keep an eye on. Next picture. So rain sensors. Rain sensors are very important because what they do is they shut your system off when it's raining or maybe it's just rained. So I'm sure all of you at one time or another have been driving around, you're driving home, driving through a neighborhood and it's pouring rain and you see somebody's sprinklers going. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, what a waste of water running your sprinklers when it's raining. Rain sensors are supposed to stop that from happening automatically, so you don't have to do it. They're generally, um, every by law is supposed to have one now. And if you ever have a professional come out and look at your system, by law, they're required to check your rain sensor. And if it's broken, they have to tell you and you have to get it replaced. Not very expensive, but it is very important. This is a funny looking little thing that's um, generally mounted along your roof line somewhere around your house. So if you've never noticed it before, if you go out today and walk around your house, you're going to find one if you have an in-ground system. So this automatically, electronically turns off your system, either when it's raining or we've just had plenty of rain. The little um, contraption gets wet when it rains and automatically opens the circuit and shuts things off. When it dries out, it closes the circuit. So now if your system tries to go on, it can. These things are notorious for breaking. They're not very expensive. They're, it's pretty simple little electronic device. They don't last forever. I think research has found they only work or are good for one or two years. So if yours is 20 years old, I can almost guarantee you it either doesn't work at all or it's not working correctly. But if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities Department, we have good news for you. Next slide. Not quite the next slide, but then the one Okay, one really one. close to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna show you how not to have your rain sensor hooked up. This is the last house that we lived in and it had a really unusual rain sensor that I had never seen before. It's like a little tray. And when it rains, it fills up with water. And you can see those two little electrodes. I assume that when those electrodes are sitting in a little dish of water, it turns the system off. Doesn't sound really safe to me. I mean, this is low voltage, it's not dangerous. Really, really unusual. But somebody had pointed it down. So I don't care how much rain we get, if you point that one down, it's never going to fill up with water and it's never, ever going to engage and work. So if you have a really old sensor like this, number one, my guess is it probably doesn't work. Number two, if it's pointed down, it's definitely not going to work. So I'm, I'm not sure if my house was the only one in the world that had this. Like I said, I've never seen it before. So we do have some good news from Lily here about the rain sensor rebate program. If if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities and you know, to receive your water, um, we've had a rain sensor rebate program for many, many years. Um, how it works is um, your house has to be uh, older than 2010, has to have been built in 2010 or prior. 
as well as your irrigation system has to be, you know, that same age. Um, you have to utilize one of our participating uh, irrigation companies. How this works is we, we provide this program every year, along with a low flow toilet program. And we invite the plumbers and the irrigation contractors. We get their names from the uh, building department and we send them letters and say, would you like to participate in this? And then they just have to come to one very short meeting to learn how the program works. And these are the ones this year who have chosen <laughs> To participate, a lot of times we have the, you know, you'll see a lot of the same companies want to continue to participate and sometimes some back off for a while or we get new ones, but these are the ones that um, are participating this year. So you have to contact one of those three companies, so I'll call them all, you know, if you're having issues with your irrigation system, they will come out and replace your irrigation system. I don't know what their cost, you know, generally is, but you you can find that out from them. And they may also then say, we also need to do this, this, and this, you know, that's between you and them. But they will bring with them, if you ask them, a packet of information. And in there will be a application that you fill out and return back to us so that if everything, you know, is as it should be, you have meet all the qualifications. We received that application. You will get a $55 water bill credit for having gotten your new um, brain sensor. So it's a one-time credit. And now people do get confused about that. And I get phone calls from people saying, hey, I have a rain sensor. Yay, <laughs> you know, we're very happy. We want everyone to have a rain sensor. But to Claude, this isn't just for everyone who happens to have a rain sensor. It's for those who have homes older than 2010 who get a new one through working through one of these, uh, one of the participating companies. There are, um, if you like live in villas and your HOA came through and replaced everybody's, you know, that doesn't count either. It has to be, you know, a personal transaction you have done. And um, it is a great way to get, you know, a $55 water bill credit. So give us a call at 754-4705 or contact one of these three uh, irrigation companies. And they know all about the information as well. Okay. So a little bit more about how to use your in-ground irrigation system. Next slide. Oh, this would be me again. <laughs> yes, it is. You, <laughs> yes. you handle the restriction. You know them yes. better than I do. We do have, and I don't know why this is currently under once so a week, <laughs> watering irrigation that, that kind of insinuate, it's, insinuates it's going to change. It's not. <laughs> um, we've been this way the better part of 12 years. And as Bill mentioned in the beginning, um, we do average about 150, 160 gallons per person, um, you know, in our municipal system. Um, and the reason we do that is because we are on one day a week <laughs> watering. Um, in this 12 year period, there was about a six month period, maybe around 04, somewhere around that. We went back to, you know, defaulting to the water management district's overall rules, which is two times a week. That same water management district allows us a certain amount of water to pull from the aquifer or we, be, we get fined. Do you know what happened in that six month period? We pulled more than our permit allowed and we were fined. That's eventually, you know, gonna show up you know, in, in the customer's prices, if that keeps happening. So therefore, we're, we've been on one day a week ever since. We stay within the limits of what we are allowed to pull from the aquifer, you know, as designated by the water management district. Um, I think there may have been a time last May when it was really, 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 really dry. It was like one of the few times we had gone over. So these are our uh, watering days. 
And the biggest misconception that occurs in this county, and uh, this has really come to a head right now, is this applies to everyone. The biggest misconception is people feel if they have a private will that these rules do not apply to them. Go tell your brother, your cousin, your old friend, you know, who lives, who has a private well. I have a private well. These watering restrictions apply to me. They apply to every person in Hernando County. They apply to your friend on the river who has an irrigation well that pulls out of the river. They apply to everyone. Um, why? People, you know, get very... They get very uh, territorial over the water. And Dr. Lester, who in Florida owns the water? Do you know the answer to that? The state, <laughs> but technically all of us. <laughs> Everybody and nobody. <laughs> we don't have, when you buy your property, private well on it or not, you have not automatically purchased water rights. There was no water rights paperwork when I purchased my house. You know, it doesn't, there's no walls in the aquifer between my house and the neighbor's house saying this is my water and this is Gary's water. That is, you know, that is not how it works. We are all pulling from the aquifer. So we set these one day a week <coughs> watering restrictions and staggered them out because we have now, I bet there's about 180,000 people, you know, in the county that we have to make sure that they're not all deciding at 5.30 on Monday is the time to, for them to water. That's a lot of pressure on the aquifer, um, which is also why we gave you the two uh, choices of times on your actual day before 8 a.m. or that's not an and, is it, Dr. Lester? Or after 6 p.m. Not both. And Bill and I will both tell you if we're if we're talking about the health of your lawn, we're going to suggest that before 8 a.m. is much better for the health of your lawn, that morning period there. Um, if you are in um, specifically a gated community of timber pines, some others, I don't know. <laughs> But we know Timber Pines, you know, has petitioned, they have a, a, a permit to have different days than what the county has. And I've been getting phone calls about that, which is right. My HOA or the county, if you live in Timber Pines, call your HOA and say, what is my day? Don't get overexcited if you don't live in Timber Pines and say they're getting something we're not. It's still one day a week. They just want to control the days for their own water systems, you know, in their series of villages that they have there. They're still under one day. The amount of time that they can water a week is the same as everybody else. Um, while I'm here, I'm going to let everybody know um, because I've been getting phone calls and there's a whole lot of chatter on different Facebook groups, isn't there, Bill? People think yeah. there is an uptake in neighbors reporting them. So before we um, allow civil wars, civil neighborhood wars to occur, perhaps we should let you know that that's probably not the case. Your neighbors haven't suddenly decided to start reporting you if you are violating the watering restrictions. What has happened is code, is we've gotten serious. <laughs> you know, that's basically it. And code enforcement is hired two code enforcement officers who are actually water resource officers. Every code enforcement officer, if they catch you violating, you will get cited. But these two, that's their job is just water. So, you know, trash, signs, um, whatever things like, you know, that's not their purview, watering is. And they've been out there and they've been doing their job. So that is why I get phone calls. <laughs> And that is why there's a lot of chatter on Facebook and people feeling it's not fair. And what it makes me think of, Bill, is when you when people say, you know, it's not fair that I got a speeding ticket because the police officer was hidden. That's entrapment. 
No, that, that's not the definition of entrapment. Entrapment is if the officer somehow made you speed and then ticketed you <laughs> for it. Just ticketing you for speeding and because he was hiding, you know what? You weren't supposed to have been speeding, whether he was there or not. <laughs> so the same thing with watering restrictions. You know, now you know the rules. They don't give warnings at code enforcement. Your first fine is $100. Your second fine is $500. And your third is a um, court case with a special magistrate. If you do those three things within a five-year period, that is what occurs. Pass the word because they're giving them to private well owners as well. Just Hernando County with our, well, you know, with our growth and all of that, you know, it's time that we take watering restrictions seriously. So that's what's happening with that. One other question, Bill, maybe let's see if you have an answer to this, because I get this a lot too. If I'm just putting it back in the ground, what does it matter? It, that doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I know, but they say, why? Why are you so particular about it? They don't quite understand the, the water cycle, you know, as it is. Yeah, you're pouring it back into the ground, but it's not like pouring, I have two cups and I'm pouring the water back and forth. You mentioned a lot, probably 50%, even on a good day is lost to evaporation back in the water cycle again. And even its journey through your lawn, through the ground, into the aquifer. It's a pretty long journey for each drop of water. Yes, we have the same amount of water we have had since the beginning of time. Same amount of water, way more people. And that's the reality you know, of what we're dealing with. And of course, as we all know, not all of the water is available for us at all times. Okay, that's my spiel. I will move on. <laughs> Oh, no, I'll talk about this, too. Um, if you have new, um, new sod, you know, we do have a um, variance on those one-day-a-week watering rules for the first 60 days. The best thing to do is email me, and I will send you this. Actually, I'll send it to you more in a, you know, written out in an email form that's easier to follow than this chart. A lot of times what happens many, 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 many times, because I get the phone calls, is, oh my God, my water bill, because my sod guy said, just water each zone an hour every day for your new sod, you'll be fine. What do you have to say about that, Bill? If you do that, you're going to be broke too. Yes. Because that That's uses true. a huge amount of water. New sod does, you have to keep it from drying out. And if you look at this table here, you're just running it, you're running it a couple times a day, but just for a very, very short period of time to keep things moist until that grass gets rooted. And over time, you're watering less and less and less until at the end of 30 days, you're on the regular schedule of just watering once a week and your lawn will do just fine if you follow the schedule. Yes. Yes, um, it's a nice variance for those, you know, getting new sod. I've been getting a lot of questions about uh, people wanting to reseed. You know, they just assume if they reseed, they get these same watering rules. We fall back on the water management district's rules for establishing new plants when it comes to seeds. And here are basically the rules for that. For your seed, to qualify for this exemption, 50% or more of your zone has to be bare dirt. I mean, not one weed. I mean, bare dirt for that zone to qualify, you know, for this uh, new plant material watering, you know, chart here. If it is less than 50% um, and you have just, bare spots. They refer to those as hot spots. And what you're allowed to do is water that in using a targeted means only at that spot. 
What does that targeted means mean? It means you with a hose in your hand that has a self-canceling nozzle, not just open hose, one that turns off if you drop it, or a ho old-fashioned hose and sprinkler that is only reaching that bare spot. So you are um, more likely to do so with one of those round donut ones that you know is only reaching that spot, not one that is sending water beyond that to make sure that you are following the rules about those hot spots. And you are much better off doing that before eight or after six, you know, um, so you're, you're just not losing it to irrigation. And also, you know, code enforcement is out there, you know, looking people watering in the day. That's just, you know, not going to be an allowed thing. If you just want to go out and throw seed down over an existing lawn, a lot of people do that in the winter with winter rye, um, that does not qualify for any extra watering days. So, you know, because it should be protected by the grass, you know, and get enough water on your regular watering routine. Those are the rules for that. You can always email me and I'll be glad to send you that information in writing. And near the end, um, um, I'll tell you about a, a class we did talking about all these nitty gritty Fairly fascinating rules. Okay, now back to Bill. So obviously here in Hernando County, we are under watering restrictions where you're only allowed to run your in-ground irrigation system once a week on your proper day. Um, but you only need to do that as needed. So if it's during the summer, we're getting really regular rain. Just because it's your day to water, it doesn't mean that you have to water on that day. If we're getting plenty of rain, you can shut the system off. Most people are going to shut, just throw the switch and turn the system off for the summer. Unless things get really dry, then they're going to go out there and, and just turn it on on their day to run just on occasion. So um, we're going to show you what dried out grass looks like. And this is going to be an indication that maybe your lawn does need to be watered this week. Next slide. So grass, when it gets really dry, the grass blade will curve and make almost a little bit of a tube because it's trying to um, retain the water. That way the blade loses less water. So if, you, if your grass starts to look like this, it's a little hard to tell from the picture, but these blades are folded over and kind of curled around and looks obviously dry. Next picture. If you go out to your lawn and step on it and your feet leave footprints and you wait for a minute or two and the grass doesn't spring back up, the footprints stay visible in the grass, that means it's really, really dried out. Uh, well hydrated grass will spring back pretty quickly, but it's really dried out and you step on it, it lays down and it just kind of stays there. Next picture. Here's an example of you might, if this is your backyard, you're gonna look at this and go like, oh my gosh, my grass is really dry. I guess I need to water this week. But if you look a little bit further beyond and the next door, probably the next door neighbor's yard, it looks green and healthy. So this is gonna be an indication of probably a broken, damaged, or misaligned sprinkler head. So everything is looking pretty good, except for this one little area. And if you track back which sprinkler head is supposed to water this area, that's probably what this problem is. Next slide. So if you're wondering, and we get this question sometimes, how long do I run my system for? That can get a little confusing because the different types of heads are going to run for different amounts of time. If you remember at the very beginning, I mentioned rotor heads may have to run 60, 70 minutes to actually cover the area they're supposed to cover. The pop-up or spray heads might run for as little as 15 minutes. So if whoever designed and installed your system mixed those two heads in the zones, 
you have a problem. So we tell people if you're putting together your own system or retrofitting it, don't mix the different heads in the same zone. One way that you could tell if your uh, zones are running for the amount of time that they should be is called the catch can test. So you're going to get a bunch of little containers, kaku cans, tuna cans, anything hold a small amount of water and then scatter them around your yard and start running your uh, irrigation system one zone at a time. You're going to start with zone one, turn it on. Let's say it's set to run for 40 minutes run it for 40 minutes and see and then go back out there after it's done running for that 40 minutes and measure how much water is in each can. We recommend each time you water to put down between half and three quarters of an inch of water. So from the little picture here, you can kind of see in the bottom corner in that one can, there's about three quarters of an inch of water. That's perfect. But if you're going around checking these cans, and it's like, looks good, looks good. Here's a can that's empty or almost empty. Start looking for a broken sprinkler head or one that's out of alignment, because obviously in that spot, it's not getting the amount of water that it should be. If you run it for 40 minutes, you go out there and check, and the little cans are overflowing, adjust the time back. If your zone is set for only 10 minutes, you run it for 10 minutes, you go out there and there's hardly any water in any of the cans, it's going to have to run for a little bit longer. So this is how you can actually kind of fine tune the amount of time that each zone runs so that you're putting down half to three quarters of an inch of water, but not too much. People whose zones all run and they put down a consistent inch or more of water per zone, you're just wasting water you're washing away any fertilizer that you just put down. If you fertilize your lawn and add one inch of water, it's gonna push that fertilizer deep into the ground, well beyond the reach of the turf grass roots and it's wasted. You wasted your time, your money. If you're paying for the water, you're gonna be paying even more. You're gonna see even bigger water bills. So stick to between half and three quarters of an inch and you'll be good and start saving tuna cans or cat food cans if you have a, a cat, because they can come in really handy when you're out there checking your system. Next picture. Well, first I wanted to comment that you can do this test for the 40 minutes on your watering day at your watering time. Otherwise, you are allowed to test each zone um, for 10 minutes if it's not your watering day. And then you might just wanna do the math from there, if you can't work it out to do it, you know, at your watering day and time, but you're allowed to do 10 minutes per zone once a week. Um, that's allowed within the within the rules uh, to calibrate and check your system. So, and of course, when you're doing this, that's when you're going to check for broken heads, yes, uh, out of calibration heads, ones that are pointing in the wrong direction. You're going to look for water bubbling up from underground. That's always a bad sign. So because you can go this is usually all of this all at the same time. Yeah, it's running when in the middle of the night when you're asleep. So it is a good thing to go around and and check things out. Um, the other thing you mentioned was about fertilization. <laughs> That's another rule you need to know. <laughs> um, if you do your own fertilizing and the bag says water it in, so you have to do that when it's your time to water. If you have a company that comes and does that, you're not gonna succeed in getting them to come You know, when it's your time to water. So therefore, if they put out one of their little signs, then you're allowed to water, in, water it in. Most of them don't need them watered in instantaneously. You can wait till after six that day to water it in. Yeah, Just yeah. keep that sign out from that professional. If you are doing it yourself though, you will get, you know, cited if you're not doing it on your watering day. Just something else to know. So we're going to go through some pictures here and we're going to kind of try to figure out if it's an irrigation problem or some other kind of problem. The picture on the left here, this could be a lot of different things. This is a um, turf grass disease issue. So you 
you have to look at a lot of different possibilities if you have a unusual brown or dead spot in your yard. Picture on the right here, probably not an irrigation problem. This looks like somebody parking on the grass. And whether you have St. Augustine or Bahia or even Zoysia, none of them take traffic, really heavy traffic well. So if you drive over them, if you're parking cars or trucks or trailers on them, you're going to eventually damage the grass. None of them take all that heavy traffic really well. So because of the lines on there, I would guess somebody's been parking on the grass. Next slide. So if you live in a, a subdivision with zero lot line properties and your house is very close to the next house, when you water your lawn, let's say you live on the right-hand side here, your data water is Wednesday, your sprinklers are going to cover that entire area. Let's say your neighbor on the left there, his day is Thursdays, and he runs his irrigation. It's going to cover the whole area there. When it rains, it covers the whole area there. These areas tend to not dry out very quickly because of the heavy shade from you know, two houses next to each other. If it stays dark there, it's not going to dry out very quickly. So what happens is over time, it gets wet. And you have a root rot problem like the picture on the left-hand side here. Or if it's kind of dipped down in a little bit of a swale and too much water sits there for too long, at the um, bottom of the dip, you're going to have turf grass. So this isn't too little water, it's way too much water. Next slide. So in this picture, what could this problem be? I don't know, could be a lot of things. Could be a broken sprinkler head, could be too much traffic, could be a um, fungal turf grass disease, could be several other possible things. So could be chinch bugs, because chinch bugs, if you have a St. Augustine lawn and you do ever have a chinch bug problem, they really favor hot, dry spots, like right next to a driveway or sidewalk, and it's kind of close to them. So sometimes problems aren't really obvious. You're going to have to look a lot deeper and a lot closer to eliminate certain things and figure out what it is. So don't assume that because you have a brown spot or a brown area in your yard, it's because you need to water more. Maybe that's not the problem or the solution. Next slide. So the picture on the left here is obviously an irrigation problem. If you're, any of your heads run to the point where you're creating like a little lake or a little marsh in your yard, that's probably running too long. So you're going to want to check the timing on that. If you have cans there, they would have been overflowing 10 minutes ago. So you're going to have to look a little bit deeper into adjusting the time, possibly broken head, possibly broken pipe underground, but there's something wrong with that picture on the left that you have to look into. Sometimes we get like the picture on the right here. And people say, I have a spot in my yard, it's small and round and it's totally brown and dead. And then we ask them, do you have a dog? Does your neighbor a dog. Have a dog in the same spot in your yard time after time after time again. Dogs sometimes like to go in the exact same spot. Dog urine is very high in nitrogen and will burn a spot in your lawn if they keep going in the same spot. <coughs> so if you can get the dog to go in different spots of your yard, or if you do have a spot like this, if you just get your garden hose and kind of water it really well and flush it out some, it'll come back. It doesn't kill the grass permanently. It just makes it turn brown and die back for a little bit. So obviously lots of possible problems can be going on out in your yard. So to wrap it up, make sure you set your irrigation system to only go on at the right time of day on the correct day Otherwise, if you live in Hernando County or other counties, I'm not sure how well these things are enforced in any other counties, you could run afoul of the law and get a ticket or a citation. Um, you can always turn your irrigation system off and then as needed, it's like, you know, it's been dry for a couple of weeks. My lawn looks dry. 
that guy on the video told me that, you know, if the grass blades curl up, they're dry and they're curling up. Let's see, today's Wednesday, today's my day to water. So this evening after six, I'm gonna go out there and throw the switch and run my system once and water. That's fine. Just because it's your day to water doesn't mean you have to. Automatic irrigation is made to supplement natural rainfall. So if we're getting plenty of natural rainfall, you may not need to supplement it. A problem with your lawn is probably not due to a lack of water. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. A lot of possibilities. Evaluate, calibrate, and check your irrigation system frequently. Like I said, if you have a lawn service, you're going to have to do it even more frequently. If you have a large riding mower, you're probably bumping sprinkler heads without knowing it, so check it more often. Make sure your rain sensor is functioning properly. Consider reducing your lawn areas. If you're having problems with maintaining and keeping a lawn alive, start to spread on your flower beds and other hardscapes, start to shrink back on the turf grass area. And remember right now, 60% of Florida's water is used to water lawns. Over time, the restrictions are only gonna get tighter and more restrictive. So if you're thinking that, well, maybe next year, Lily's gonna tell me that they just did away with watering restrictions and I can water seven days a week, Sorry, guys, that's probably not going to happen. It's only going to get tighter. So start getting used to that idea now and make some changes in your landscape to save water, save money, have a good looking yard and a properly functioning irrigation system. Lily, I think that's all from my yes. side. Thank you very much for educating us as always, Bill. Um, we, you can learn more <laughs> about these topics. And some of the, you know, nitty gritty little rules I was telling you about, that's because I studied them and studied the water management district's rules and also the absolutely riveting Hernando County Municipal Code book about watering. But I did that so I could make a video and bring the information to you in a, you know, little in more snippets for you to be able to understand. So if you want to know, know more about all the rules of, you know, when you can water, you know, regarding, uh, you know, vegetable gardens, which, by the way, are not on <laughs> watering restrictions, um, you know, hand watering, all this, all this information, go to Hernando County Government YouTube. Hernando County has a YouTube, but go to Hernando County Government YouTube. Go to my playlist, which is Florida Friendly Landscaping. Here are six of the, the classes out of the 107 or something like that that's on there that'll probably um, be useful for you to study more about this. So Hernando's Water Rules is definitely one of them. Turf Talk with Bernie. Bernie is a very uh, knowledgeable master gardener, and that's a great class. Micro irrigation in the landscape. Dr. Lister will tell you more about micro irrigation. Landscape care when it's hot and dry. We're not gonna get rains till mid-June, so it's a good time to, uh, to watch that one. Everything you always wanted to know about your Florida lawn and also her home turf advantage, lawn care the Florida friendly way. Check those out so you can learn more about caring for your lawn and saving water. The Hernando County Master Gardeners and I and several other groups of people are hosting a uh, Earth Day celebration on Earth Day, Saturday, April 22nd. It's at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery at 19490 Oliver Street in Brooksville that is near Animal Control. Oliver Street is just north of the fairgrounds off of Highway 41. Just follow it to the very end. You'll be back in their parking lot. 9 to 12, they do have Florida-friendly plants for sale. We'll have uh, kids' crafts tables, native plant information. The three actual workshops will be a macro photography workshop so you can learn to take pictures like this <laughs> or of insects or many other things. Um, 
a native plant propagation workshop and somebody is going to do a pruning demonstration. Um, Bill's going to make sure that happens, aren't you, Bill? <laughs> also, yep. we will, I'm sorry? I said yes. Yes. It may be him, <laughs> but somebody <laughs> is going to do it. Mosquito Control will be out there with us as well as Hernando Audubon, and they are going to have bluebird houses and bee houses for sale. Storm water, emergency management, we're just going to have a good time out there. It's free and everybody is welcome. So please join us for that. And Dr. Lester and I will certainly be there as well. More of our upcoming Zoom classes, just like this one, all at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday. Come back next week where Dr. Bill is going to talk about the what, when, where, why of fertilizing Florida yards. Also, um, then we won't have a class until April 19th. Um, that's unwelcome guests in the garden. It's not your neighbors. We're talking about invasive plants in, the, in that class. And also May 24th will be the one after that. Um, Florida Friendly Landscaping is 30 years old this year. So in, in honor of that, they have a, uh, a pledge program, you know, uh, at the state level, taking the pledge to go Florida friendly. So in honor of its 30th birthday, we're going to take you through the steps. It's a whole lot easier. There's, there's a yard certification process, but just this pledge, you know, this personal pledge that you take to go Florida friendly is a whole lot easier and many more people can do so. As we mentioned, um, we have various ways of, uh, you know, ways that we reach out through social media. Here's my Facebook page. Please go to Hernando County Government YouTube. There's so much information on there. Dr. Bill has a playlist as well from Hernando Extension. Plus he's on about half of my <laughs> um, videos as well. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Great way to find out what's going on. Bill, I'll let you cover, uh, well, at least the extension part of this one. If you want to talk to someone in person or on the phone, who are you going to call? The best person to call is our master gardener, Bernie, and he is at the office all day long on Thursdays. So if you want to call and ask a question, call and speak to Bernie on Thursday. If you have something that you need to show him, you know, a leaf or a section of dead lawn or a branch or, or a strange insect or whatever it might be, bring it by the office on Thursday. That way he can sit down with you and go ahead and answer your question right away. Okay. And that's Thursdays. Yes. Now, if you have questions regarding uh, the watering restrictions, um, here's our water conservation uh, phone number. I'm going to be the one who's going to get back to you with that one. If you have received a citation and you just want to call and yell at me, then go ahead and go right to code enforcement. <laughs> and their phone number is down here, 352-754-4056. We didn't give the citation. I don't know the details behind what happened. That's who you need to talk to. If you want to know just ways that you can conserve water, or again, details about the restrictions in general, I'll be glad to talk to you. If you want to yell at someone that you got a citation, please call code enforcement. And they can also, you know, if it's something you need to hash out, they're the ones you need to talk to. Here again are our emails. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this morning. It was a very interesting class, Dr. Lester. And be sure to join us next week for the class on the what, when, where, why, should be also how, of Florida-friendly fertilizing. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful Florida-friendly week. Thank you.